Let, it's it's sorry we're we're chatty, but let's let's start with it. we'll we'll pray and then we'll begin. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, everybody gathered here today, uh, all the ladies and Bob. Um, we appreciate the, the way that you care for us and look out for us, and we don't always thank you for it. We don't always recognize it. Sometimes when our life is a little bit more chaotic and things seem to be going out of control, we, we realize, Lord, that we need you. But when things are going smooth, we don't realize that you're in charge of that, too, and that you are behind that. So help us, Lord, to have grateful hearts for the good days and for the bad days, because you are with us in all of them. We thank you, Lord, that uh, that this procedure that Bev was looking at that uh, had this issue last time with the allergic reaction, that that's back on the schedule again for next Tuesday. And we pray that this time around that everything will go much better and much more smoothly. We pray, Lord, that this procedure would be powerful and effective to uh, reduce and eliminate the tremors that she's feeling in uh, in her one hand and that moving forward, they'll be able to do this on the other side as well. We thank you that you've been with people who have been traveling, that you blessed them with safety. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of health, and we pray that you would always give us uh, good health and, and vigor and energy to be your people and to live out the lives that you have given us to the fullest. Be with us now. Uh, send your Holy Spirit upon us as we look into your word and open it to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, because I was running a little bit behind, I only have a few. We're still on last week's handout, so I only have a few of them. So I know some of you need them. Uh, if, if you didn't bring it, it's the one that says Mark 1, 21 through 28 at the top. Uh, it's a two. Okay, I have, I have one last copy if anybody else. Um... Okay, so we were in this section, again, Jesus is just beginning his, his ministry, and things are starting with a bang. Uh, he goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he's teaching there, which is sort of kind of the pattern of Jesus' ministry. He would often do this, and we hear about it uh, in other Gospels in different ways. And Mark, though, kind of teases us, because... Unlike, say, Luke's gospel, where it records what Jesus actually said when he was in the, in the synagogue teaching, um, Mark doesn't give us any of that. It just says that he went and he taught, and everybody's kind of amazed at him because of the authority that he, that he teaches and speaks with. And I said, this is sort of because in that day, to be a teacher really was all about citing your sources. You're just passing on the wisdom from your predecessors. And novelty and innovation was not, was not really looked highly upon. Um, so that's what teachers did. But we know that Jesus, and we know this from the other Gospels, that when Jesus taught, he would say things like, you have heard it said of old, but I tell you. And normally a teacher would not do that. The teacher would say, oh, you remember what Rabbi so-and-so said, and Rabbi so-and-so said, and, and they would just be, you know, like walking encyclopedias. They don't have Wikipedia. They don't have access to libraries. So people are kind of like that community wisdom. You go to that person and, and they tell you. But Jesus didn't do that. He spoke from his own wisdom and his own authority, and he can do that because he's the son of God. So that's one part of his teaching that was kind of unique. But also, we know from Luke's gospel, and we have to keep importing this, and I, I normally you try to read one gospel kind of on its own and, and don't bring in the other ideas, because you just want to hear what was Mark's story? What did he want people to get? But as we kind of have said, Mark seems to write as if people already know some things about Jesus. That's why he doesn't go into great detail in all places. He just sort of goes. So we import from Luke's gospel when Jesus began his ministry that he read this passage from Isaiah that we've already looked at and Mark kind of quoted at the beginning where it talked about the spirit has anointed me to preach the good news, to uh, declare freedom for the captives, to heal the sick, and Jesus read that portion of, it's from Isaiah, and he said, today, this scripture has been fulfilled 
in your hearing. And people are like, wait a second, that, that's a prophecy. Uh, and, and there was debates among the Jews of who, who was that prophecy about, but at least one answer to that was it was about the Messiah. And so Jesus doesn't go in and say, hi, I'm the Messiah, right? Um, other people did that. But what he basically did was he did the messianic things and let the people connect the dots for themselves because he didn't want to put that confession of faith in their mouth. He, he wanted them to confess their faith. You see me now. What do you say? Who do you say I am? Right. Um, and so that was something that Jesus did in the synagogues. So all Mark says is the people witnessed what he did and they were amazed at his authority. He didn't teach like the scribes. He didn't teach like everybody else. And then we got into this interchange. There at the synagogue is a man with an unclean spirit. And that's really out of place. Um, an unclean spirit is basically another way of saying a demon. Um, so a demon-possessed man comes to church one day. You're like, that's, that's not exactly where you would expect to find a, a demon-possessed person. What's going on here? But Willie. Yeah, but there's a confrontation. There's something, there's something that's going to go on. And uh, this unclean spirit is, is prepared for this confrontation and cries out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So that's as far as we got last time. We, we looked at those things that this, this unclean spirit said. They identify exactly who Jesus is, um, that he's Jesus of Nazar Nazareth, but the demon's a little bit scared. Have you come to destroy us? And the demon knows that this is the son of God and knows the end game, like knows that, that the demon can't win, that the God has more power and authority. doesn't mean that the demon can't cause problems and, and whatnot. That's, that's what Satan, Satan knows the same game plan knows that he ultimately cannot win, but it won't stop him from fighting, won't stop him from taking as many captives as, as he can. But Mark's gospel set this up in the way that it began because Mark's gospel prepared us for the coming of God, the day of the Lord, that day of judgment. And the demon is basically saying, uh-oh, is time up? Is it judgment day? Have you come to, you know, send us to the abyss? And Jesus didn't come to do that right now, but he did come to free the captives, to proclaim that the game is over, the battle is won. Yeah, there's still time, but that time in Jesus's hands is so that more people could be saved, right? The time that Jesus gives is so that more people would know the good no news, would know that salvation. And so it's, it's a gift to us. It's a gift that we have time to come to faith ourselves. It's a gift that we have time to share the good news with other people. Um, but the end is guaranteed. The, the, there is no question on how the story ends. This That's demon probably, is unclear on the timeline, though, just like the people are. That's probably why the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those guys in power, mm -hmm. said, who are you, you know, all mm -hmm. of a sudden you're going to take away everything that we've got mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. going to show us to be telling not the truth right. or withholding the truth. Right. But the irony of all of this is in that synagogue, everybody else, they don't, they don't know who Jesus is. They, they know some things about him. They know that he teaches differently than everybody else. They know that he has authority, uh, more authority than other teachers, but they don't know what to do with that. This demon, on the other hand, this unclean spirit, knows exactly who Jesus is. Um, and so that, that spiritual battle that's going on that we can't see with our eyes because we don't have spiritual vision the, the whole game is laid clear to them, but to our eyes, it's, it's hidden. 
It's it's blurry. We don't we don't understand those spiritual battles, and that should give us a little bit of humility, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and I've talked about this before, but the spiritual world exists. There there are God's side and and the angels on His side, but there is Satan's side and his demons, the fallen angels as well, and ignorance of that world, I, I don't think is a good thing. Paul wanted the Christians to be aware of it and, and to be aware of it in such a, a respect that he says, our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against all of those powers and the principalities and the forces of darkness, of Satan. And so, you know, again, the rubber hits the road, Bob, when we talk about these conflicts, these wars that exist out there, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's Gaza, Israel and whatnot, we, we with our eyes just like to draw that dividing line. Here's the good guys. Here's the bad guys. And we know we want the good guys to, you know, do good and we want them to whoop up on those bad guys. That's not the full picture. We're not seeing the world as God sees it, as these spiritual forces see it. There's spiritual warfare going on. And again, God could rightly say, all humanity is my enemy because all humans are sinners. But God doesn't do that. God wants all sinners to be redeemed and saved. He wants them all to worship him. He wants all of them to worship him. And so we're stuck in this really, you know, kind of gray area where those those people, Hamas, who are behind, behind the, the bombings and the kidnappings and whatnot, we both in our hearts want them to be saved, to repent, to come to faith in Jesus, but we also need to recognize that justice needs also to be done and and they need to pay for their crimes. But ultimately what we don't want is is judgment of death. We, we want judgment to be done, but also for them to come to faith. And in our human hearts, it's almost impossible for those two feelings to exist at the same time. And, and it is a challenge. God's heart is bigger than ours and, and God, God can do it. And, and so when we get to these situations, I think Jesus gives us the best prayer that we can pray is, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. God, I don't know what that looks like. I think I know what that looks like, or I think I know what I want it to look like. You know, get rid of all of those bad guys. You know, kill them all, destroy them, eradicate them. Um, but that's not God's game plan. It, it's, it's a much more challenging one. And these spiritual realities blur our vision because those people are people that Jesus died for too. They've been seduced by the lies of Satan, by hatred, by fear, by, you know, whatever. And, and they do not see the world as they should, as we do through the eyes of faith. That's why we have laws too. You mm -hmm. do this, you're going to get that. Yeah. And, and again, this, this is all God's design. He mm -hmm. says, I've, I've given those governments um, I've given the government's authority, authority yeah. to lay down the law to protect the weak, the innocent. Like, we need that in a world of sinners. Yeah. But that's a temporary thing. <laughs> Ultimately, God's, God's kingdom is the real kingdom. And so he wants us to, to be in that kingdom. That's almost hard to imagine that there's, like you say, mm -hmm. there might not be any laws in heaven. Mm -hmm. Because we all believe in him and we all do good. Yeah. Yeah, our our hearts will be led led by love perfectly. There's no jail or prison or anything. It's just no need. Yeah. No need for it. Yeah. Sin sin has completely Well, that's going to be different. Completely warped what God's design was, but in that new creation, it will be as as it should be. Yeah. And yeah, perfect. Love everybody. Mhm. Mm Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah indeed. <laughs> um the problem with us is we're stuck in this world where we don't see clearly and and mark brings this right to the forefront again we don't we don't think and talk a lot about spirits and demons and and whatnot and part of the reason i think why i, I do believe those things still exist i mean the spiritual world is still out there and and demon possession is still a thing but i think it's it's so present in the gospels because 
Jesus is ground zero. And where Jesus is, there, like, if we can stop this, if we can get in the way of Jesus's mission, you know, we, we, we will win. They can't win, but that's, you know, that's the, that's the game plan. And so we already saw Jesus went into the wilderness, and who's there? Satan. Mm-hmm. Jesus is now speaking with the people and, and actually telling this good news, and who's there? Satan in different a different way now through demon possessed people, but what we see is Satan in the wilderness couldn't stop him. These these demon possessed people won't stop him, and in fact, he will free the people from that demon possession. Yeah, his his authority is not just words, but words that can do things. Um, but Mark confronts us with this world that again it's it's a little bit crazy. Um, I think where de- where de- where you see demons a lot in in our world, and it's it's widely acknowledged is is still kind of by analogy the same the same place. It's at the forefront of of missions and missionaries. So when missionaries are going to places with the gospel for the first time, they run into a lot of spiritual warfare. And, and again, that's because Satan like puts up a fence, right? A line of defense of if, if, if they get through here, they'll be behind en- enemy lines. And who knows what that gospel will do. And, and so you read about a lot of like in, in Africa, in South America, and, you know, in those jungle places, right? Um, spiritual warfare is, is really, really present. You don't read and hear about it as much in America, but it's it is just as pro, yeah it it just it takes another form. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know I, I think racism is is a form of spiritual warfare that that God would get in people's hearts and again God's picture is. I created them all, and they're all beautiful in his eyes. But if, if Satan can say, no, some are better than others, that's Satan sowing those seeds of division, mm-hmm. right? Um, our politics, I, I think our politics is full of, of demonic and spiritual warfare. Yeah. And the biggest reason why I think it is because our, our politics, and this, this isn't unique to us, this happens in every place, has, it, it's turned into power, right and it's who can hold on to the power and you know all of those secret meetings they what do they want to do they want to do their things in darkness Mm -hmm. where where people can't see what's going on and they can't hear those conversations and that's exactly where satan works right Mm -hmm. jesus is the light of the world and he tells us to work in the light of day and he says that the the sin the sin doesn't like light and sinners don't like that, and they work in the darkness. So, again, we may not call it spiritual warfare and demonic stuff, but I think it is just by another name. Um, which, which again, is why I, I know I know we all have our different political views and beliefs, but um, the, the, in 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 God's kingdom, there are no Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, Green Party, whatever. It's it's all God's people. And we as Christians might have different views on some of these social positions because there's more than one way to solve a problem, frankly. Um, We can't let that divide us. But Satan would love for it to divide us. Um, So we we have to be careful. Satan knows what he's doing. He knows his game. We need to be shrewd and wise, too. Um, So Satan, Satan knows this. Jesus sees it all. And here's this, this confrontation, and how is it solved? It's solved in a word. Jesus just says, shut up. <laughs> Be silent. Say, say no more. And he takes away that, that demon's voice and casts that demon out from that person. Um, so verse 25 is just this. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the, the unclean spirit has no choice but to obey. Jesus has that authority over this unclean spirit. My kids don't always listen to me when I tell them to do things. I I think I have authority, but I know that my authority has limits. (laughs) Jesus' authority 
it is unquestioned. He speaks, it happens. And this unclean spirit, it, it shakes this man. It cries out with a loud voice, uh, you know, in pain and anguish. I, you know, I don't, I don't really know what spirits feel, but it's defeated. And in its defeat, it, it comes out of this man, and the man is just now a, a, a regular, normal, normal person. You know what's really scary? What would we be like, or where would we be, or our circumstances, mm -hmm. if there wasn't Jesus? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it would be absolute mm -hmm. chaos. Yeah, it, it would be un untethered hell. violence, and yeah. It, well, that, that's exactly it. It's hell. Yeah. That, that's what hell will be. Yeah. Uh, G and Jesus says, weeping, gnashing of teeth. Yeah. Uh, and not it can not be good. That way too. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. So an exorcism here, and there are going to be more of these. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this exorcism, um, mostly because I want to I want to keep going. Uh, but yeah, it, it's just this amazing thing, and this is not an everyday, ordinary experience. You know, this like this is crazy. Well, it was crazy back then too. That Jesus is doing these things. So they already were amazed by his teaching. That, that was clearly said. Now is this interaction with a demon, a demon who calls him the Holy One of God. And Jesus says, shut up and be gone. And this, this unclean spirit is gone. So what are the people's reaction going to be to that? Well, they're amazed. I mean, how, what else? Yeah. What else can you say? They questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? What in the world did we just see? A new teaching with authority. So it began with Jesus teaching, and they, they say he's teaching as one who has authority. And now it's, it's a new teaching. It's a new teaching with authority. Well, what is this about? Um, again, Jesus doesn't come to innovate, but I think that the newness is... He, he talks to demons and demons listen to him. No, nobody else does that. That's, that's a brand new kind of thing. And what are we to think about Jesus? And Mark is kind of laying the groundwork for, there's really only two conclusions. One, he either is on God's side and has power over them, or he's on Satan's side and he's in league with them. And... The people, again, they, hmm. they, they're going to have to make that decision. Jesus doesn't tell them. They have to draw their own conclusions. We know the right conclusion, but we also know some people are going to draw this opposite and wrong conclusion. Um, this new teaching with authority is that he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Wow. He's not a rabbi. Rabbis don't do that. Scribes don't do that. Um, our priests even don't really do that. Um, th this, is, this is kind of unheard of. So who is this guy? And that's, again, Mark's big question. Again and again, when you're reading, especially the opening part, he wants us to ask for ourselves, who is this guy? Mark's given us the answer at the verse one, the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of God. He, he, that's the conclusion he wants us to draw, but we have to ask ourselves and we have to answer for ourselves. So um, he puts the question in the mouths of those people, but we should be asking that too. Who is Jesus? Who indeed? Well, the conclusion of this is word gets out. So the irony is he tells this demon to shut up. He doesn't tell the people to shut up, but he tells the demon to shut up. And all of the people talk. Everybody's come to church, you know, again, their synagogue. They've come to worship. And what do they, what did they see? Well, again, a couple of weeks ago in our church, we had an interesting worship service where a gentleman came into our service and uh, he wasn't a, a born and raised Lutheran. And so he was worshiping kind of loudly and he had been drinking too. And so that created some problems. Um, and that was a really abnormal thing. I, I've been there two and a half years and haven't ever experienced anything like that. I've been in other churches, haven't really ever experienced anything like that too. 
And this passage kind of reminds me of that. Um, you know, it was clear that this person knew about Jesus. He sang along with the songs. He prayed, you know, some of the prayers with us. But it was also clear to me that he was battling demons. Um, alcoholism, for one. But his, his grief and, and anger. Um, and, you know, what... It, it, in the one hand, it's it's very alarming when something like that happens in a church setting. And you're like, yeah, hey, you don't belong here. But but on the other hand, that's exactly where you want somebody like that to be, so that we believe the Holy Spirit works through the Word, and maybe there's something there that you know touches that person on that day, um, you know. But Jesus, being the Son of God. He can do things a little bit differently, whereas the word of God is around us as we speak that word. Jesus is the word of God incarnate. And so he confronts that head on and just chases that demon away and, and life can go on. But my point is, afterwards, in both instances, people talk and be like, were you in church on Sunday? Can you believe what happened? Uh, the, and, you know, what did you think? And what did you think? And I, you know, all of these people... That day at the synagogue, they're talking. Has he been around again? No. 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 Nope. Uh, and and that's, that's how it goes, right? You know, you almost feel sorry for guys like that. Well, I hope you do. Yeah. 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 They have to have compassion. Pray he's, in, for he's in the demon's hands. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But but again, Jesus Jesus equips us and gives us yeah. prayer. And, and we pray uh, oh, yeah. and his word. And, and yet... Spiritual warfare is, is a real thing, and um, for those who have ever battled addictions, you know you don't get out of it by yourself, no. because no. Those, those forces are more powerful than us as individuals. Um, and so the hard part with all of these people in situations like that is, in a sense, they, they need to want the help that other people can give them, and and often they want help on their terms, terms. which isn't the right kind of help. Always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. When they really bad. Yeah, and and I mean, it's it's always been that way. Uh, It may be more pervasive uh, now, uh, but it's it isn't new. It's such a problem, Pastor. Mm-hmm. I had a father who was an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. I have a brother that's an alcoholic and mm-hmm. a drug addict. Yeah. And you just, you know, you don't, you don't know what to do to help them. Yeah. You just, you know, we've had him in rehab three times. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. He, and he has faith. Yeah. But you think, if you've got faith, how can you? Yeah. They just, you're quite right. Mm-hmm. Satan is stronger mm-hmm. than anybody in this mm-hmm. world. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, I mean, it's something that mm-hmm. I've struggled with my whole life mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. this very day. Yeah. And I never stop praying for them. Yeah. And I changed my prayer mm-hmm. because I just prayed that God would fix it. Mm-hmm. And then I realized I had to change my prayer according to your will and the mm-hmm. plan for them. Yeah. You know, have yeah. mercy on them. Yeah. And, and and do whatever you can mm-hmm. and you know is right for mm-hmm. them to be helped. Mm-hmm. But it's so it's it's so sad and that that thing that you co- commented or alluded to on their own terms mm-hmm. is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. just believe that everybody in the world's gotta take care of them, but mm-hmm. they can't take care of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. It's so tragic. Yeah, I well and I mean again, even even salvation uh, no one can believe for another person. No. It, it is all faith. Faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit, but with your tongue, you must confess with your mouth, you know. Um, and so and that's and that's, that puts us in that feeling of helplessness because we want them so badly to, to repent of their sins. We want them so badly to have faith, yeah. but we can't do it for them. And and that's a terrible feeling. It is. It's yeah. Terrible. But, again, God puts himself in that same place because he gives salvation. He gives forgiveness. He gives, but we can reject that. 
We can say no. And, and God puts himself in that most... I mean, he could be the robotic king God, right? We're all robots, and he, he's wound us all up, and we can only do what he says. Um, but that's not who he created in us. Yeah. And, and we can only imagine the grief and pain that we feel with loved ones. God feels that even deeper and even more. Um, and, and now, and now you can start to realize this, this pain is what would cause God to send his son so that, so that we would be a part of the family. Um, and, and that pain comes from a place of so deep love and compassion, which is why, you know, Bob, when you said you got to have compassion, like that, that is, that is it. That's, that's where it begins. Um, I, I think my family life has taught me lessons in mm-hmm, my life and mm-hmm. I believe we all do have lessons mm-hmm. to learn it's un- un- uh, it, it is forgiveness mm-hmm. and unconditional love mm-hmm. you know well, because it doesn't matter how bad things are you still got to mm-hmm. be there they mm-hmm. are, God tells you to take mm-hmm. care of them mm-hmm. I had two brothers that were alcoholics and yeah. a sister-in-law that was an alcoholic mm-hmm. terrible alcoholic mm-hmm. just terrible mm-hmm. Mm-hmm had three or four little girls that uh, she was blessed with. Mm-hmm. She did absolutely nothing for them. They were filthy, dirty. The house was dirty. Mm-hmm. We went out to the Plains, Illinois, to, to clean the house, and I found string hanging from the back of the stove mm-hmm. where she would put those around her bottle so her husband, my brother, couldn't see the bottle. Wow. I mean, it's, yeah. it was just... Yeah. And she died happy because she realized that Jesus had died for her and uh, she died uh, sober. Wow. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, so this this is this is the warfare. This is the this world is and cool. Jesus brings a different ending to all of that and the people see it. They cannot help but talk about it everywhere. It says it's all over. It's all in the surrounding region. So again, Galilee is that lake. And so all of the, the little fishing villages, all of the places, now they're talking about Jesus. Mm-hmm. And that's a good place for Jesus's ministry to begin. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he does the things that now people know something about him. And when he comes to those cities, Jesus is that Jesus, that Jesus, let's, let's go see him. Let's go, you know, talk to him. Let's go hear this. And it it is, John was a messenger who prepared the way, but, but Jesus is sort of preparing his own way by his own actions, the things that he does. All right. Any, any thoughts, questions on that little wrap up section? God gave us free will. So it's our free will. Choose the black stuff, or we choose the white lighted stuff. Mm-hmm. We either choose faith, or we ignore it and we go about our own mm-hmm. dirty little way, and, and we never get clean. Yeah. So by believing, you end up cleaning yourself up, and you get your act together. But again, it's got to be self-induced. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, you gotta want it. Yeah, and I think when people say, "Hey, I'm gonna pray for you," those people have planted a seed. Mm-hmm. And they might, the one that you say you're yeah. praying for, mm-hmm. it might take them years, like Bob's sister in law, mm-hmm. to finally yeah. decide to choose the right way instead of the wrong way. Yeah. And that's, you know, the devil walks. Yep. The little ways are big, big things. Yeah. The devil walks the serve. Absolutely. So Mark's not done. And like I said, we. In order to talk about it, I kind of segment these things out, but uh, it immediately goes from this, this synagogue situation and everybody's talking about it to, well, what do you do after you've had a nice day at church and you've just cast out a demon? Well, you're a little hungry, so you got to go out to eat, right? Yeah. And uh, especially on a Sabbath, they're not going to go to a restaurant or a diner because it's the Sabbath. You're not supposed to do work on the Sabbath. But you know that the Sabbath is coming, so you prepare all of the food the day before, whatever, and then people in their homes, um, just like this thing, customs have changed and whatnot, but um, I still have memories from my grandparents where Sunday, you know, our Sabbath day, truly was a day of rest. Businesses were closed, 
and Sunday was largely a family day, but my uh, mom's parents especially, um, both, uh, both my grandmother and my grandfather on my mom's side were, uh, they liked to write things. And my, my grandpa wrote some of like his own memoirs uh, just, just for the family, not like not publishing or famous or anything, but just to hand that down. But my grandmother uh, had a column in the local newspaper, which, I mean, this is small town newspaper. This isn't Dear Abby stuff. This is, you know, <laughs> the town gossip rag, right? Um, but she had a little column that she wrote in every now and then. And one of, one of, the, one of these columns, I read it as a kid, and it just stuck with me. And the headline for it was, why has dropping in dropped out? Mm -hmm. And th what the story was about was how her mother, uh, on son or her father, her mother died early in her life, but on, on Sunday mornings, her father, like you put on a pot of coffee and people just come, like the neighbors come in and visit and you talk and you get to get, you know, and that community and those relationships and her point was like even back then that that was starting to fade away, um, which and and even more so now today, yeah. where and and this is kind of Joan I think getting to our world and our culture today is so individualistic mm -hmm. and so privatized, and you know I, I don't, I don't there there are pros and cons of of that lifestyle, but it life used to be much more communal and and family and clan oriented and i don't mean that in, in a negative sense but you know we grew up the place where we live mm -hmm. and our children will grow up there and you know we all had the same teachers for high school and whatnot and and everybody knows everybody and there was something about that mm -hmm. and again there's pros and cons to that it, it can lead to clicks and gossip and and bad things too um but there's there was strength in that your kids, I don't know where my kids are, but they're with the neighbors and, mm -hmm. and they're safe. And mm -hmm. I'm not gonna let my kids roam the neighborhood in today's world. Like mm -hmm. that's that's how things have kind of changed. Mm -hmm. um, again, it, it just, you know, it is, it is what it is. But in that community, it takes the community to keep the community together. Yeah. So in the synagogue, they come together and they're the community and then they, they go back to their homes and they break bread together, mm -hmm. right? They have that, that fellowship time, that meal together. And because homes are homes, you know, you can't have 40 people there, but you can have some of the extended family come over and, and visit. And that's what this next scene is. It's just after the synagogue, they're gonna go back to somebody's house and have more fellowship, have a meal together but there's a wrinkle in the situation. So verse 29 through 34, here's the, the kind of the whole capsule. And immediately he, that is Jesus, left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Oh, by the way, those disciples, those first followers that he grabbed from the fishing nets and the boats, um, they, they've been a part of this. They, they're following Jesus, just like he said. So remember, the demon hears Jesus' command and obeys. Well, don't forget, those first disciples did the same thing. He said, follow me, and they did. And remember, he didn't just say, follow me. He says, I will make you fishers of men. He's going to do that too because he said it. His, his word, he will do it. Those fishermen might be like, whatever, um, we're going to follow him, but you know, we're going to be fishers of men. I don't even know what that means. Yeah. But Jesus does, and, and he means it, and it will happen. So here's just a reminder um, that these guys are with, with him. I'm going to continue, though. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. Again, 
who is that Jesus? It's, it's, it's there. It's the punchline. Okay, so that's the whole setting of this next section, and it's it's quick. You know, again, you have a lot more questions than Mark is is answering. He's just like, boom, boom, boom. Oh, by the way, that same day that he cast out a demon, he goes to somebody's house. Uh, she's ill. She makes He makes her well. And then everybody else, you remember that they all heard about this Jesus? Well, meanwhile, they're gathering all of their people and they're bringing him, bringing them to him. And if they're sick, he heals them. If there are demons, he casts them out. And uh, that's, that's just a regular day in Jesus's life. You know, no, no big deal. It just happens. Um, it's quite amazing if you think about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just imagine the scene. I mean, yeah. it's mind-boggling. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. But, and, and, but Mark just... It's so matter of fact, right? It, it just demons leaving. The thing of Jesus mm -hmm. got the demons out of all the politicians. Now. <laughs> <laughs> the world would be full of demons. Yeah, we we'd need a big herd of uh, pigs for him to send them into. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Come on, pig. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm looking at the clock and I'm deciding how much I should say and how much uh, we should... I'll, I'll do the first couple of verses. Okay, so immediately, that's, that's again is Mark's... He loves this word immediately. So boom, boom, boom. Things boom, they're just happening. So immediately he enters into the synagogue and teaches. Immediately there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit and immediately Jesus casts out that demon and then immediately he leaves so he's not loitering around hanging out again jesus has work to do god sent him for a purpose and he's going to do what he needs to do but it just so happens that his purpose and his plan does allow time to sit down and have lunch with people um He's at Simon and Andrew's house. So there's a lot of questions here. We're in the city of Capernaum. And so we learn in another gospel, in John's gospel, that Simon and Andrew are from a different city. They're called uh, people from Bethsaida. And um, this is not Bethsaida. This is Capernaum. So do they have different houses or was that their hometown? But now they've moved to be closer to the fishing business. There, there's a lot of questions that Mark isn't interested in answering, but um, we, we like to know some of the biography. It's Simon and Andrew's house. Does that mean it's Simon's house? Is it Andrew's house? Is it their parents' house? And again, you know, the clan sticks together. I, I, I don't know. James and John are also there with. So it's not their place, but again, where Jesus is, now these four guys are there because Jesus told them to follow him. The other question we have is, why did they go to this place? Uh, did Jesus not have his own house? I mean, we know he's from Nazareth, but he's going to be hanging out in Capernaum. Did, did he have a house there? Did he, did he rent a place? Did he stay with some extended family? We don't know. It seems that since he's leaving to go to Simon and Andrew's house, either Jesus said, hey, I don't have a place to go. Can I go to your place? Or Simon, just like... Well, again, it's Sabbath. What do we do after we go to the synagogue? We go, we go have food. Why don't you come to my place? I, I don't know, but somehow they end up at Simon and Andrew's house. But why there? It seems like it's a bad place to go because Simon's mother-in-law is ill. Now, I don't know. In my day, if somebody in my house is sick, I'm not going to invite company over because I trust that the company doesn't want the germs, right? And they don't have germ. They don't know about germs in this day, but they know about clean and unclean. And people who are sick, doesn't matter if they know about germs or not, they're unclean. You, you, don't, you don't touch with them. There's a reason on Sabbath she wasn't at the synagogue because she wouldn't have been allowed because she was sick, right? That, that's just part of that clean and unclean thing. Well, if that's true, why would they bring Jesus home? You, you kind of wonder, in the back of their mind, I have at least two options that I'm kicking around what's going on. These first disciples themselves are so blown away by what Jesus did here at the synagogue cast that they didn't even think about, oh, we can't bring him to our house. Uh, your mother-in-law is sick. That, that's not right. That's, that's one thing, that they were just so completely out of their mind. 
The other is maybe if he can do that, you know, again, what else can this guy do? Um, if he's talking about bringing the kingdom of God, you know, maybe he can he can help mom. Uh, I don't know what was their motive. I'm kind of led to believe it was more likely to be the first than the second because they immediately go back to the house and then Mark tells us, and Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a fever and it says immediately they told him about her. So the order of events is first they're going back to the house and then they tell Jesus. So it's like, oh, Simon's like, yeah, that's right. We can't go to my house because she's sick. Versus if if the story would have been told, if Mark would have said, and Simon's mother-in-law was sick, and then Jesus said, let's go to your house. That, that would have kind of, you know. So I, I think Simon, Andrew, James, and John themselves are just so, what in the world did we get ourselves into? Was this the first incident that the disciples had seen him cast out the spirits? Uh, in Mark's gospel, in yes. Mark's gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was, yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. trying to think of the sequence of events. In I mean, it's 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 early on in Jesus' <laughs> ministry, so there has to be a first for everything. Um, so if that's the case, then their minds probably were blown. Yeah, yeah. I, I, they were firmly fabricated. But, but again, Mark wants us to see that why is Jesus here? Again, th this, this wouldn't be a normal place to bring somebody, but Jesus isn't a normal person, is he? No. Who is this guy again? And you're asking that question. Um, the other passing thing is Simon's mother-in-law. So this is like the only piece of evidence we have of Simon Peter was married. Well, we never hear about his, his children and other than this, we don't, and in fact here, you don't hear about his wife. All you hear about is his mother-in-law. And so this is just biography and it doesn't really matter, but since nothing is ever said of Simon's wife, um, did, was Simon a widower? He was married, his wife died, but again, it's, it's fam family is family. And now he's gonna take care of the mother-in-law um, just like it was his own mother. I, 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 no one knows. This is just, this is in the realm of speculation. But the, by this one detail, we're like, oh, Mark, tell us more. Like, what, what else is going on? Where were the kids? You know, but um, not, nothing else is ever said. So the fact that nothing is ever said of, of his kids probably means he didn't have kids, which would have been highly unusual and usually would mean that somebody was barren, that there were fertility problems because the normal Jewish thing to do is have babies, have, have a big family, right? Be fruitful, multiply. He didn't do that. Um, and one of the reasons why could have been because his wife died uh, early on in their marriage before they were able to have kids, but he still maintains a connection with that family. Yeah. I think it's obvious that she wasn't there, at least. Simon's what, wife. Simon's mm, wife yeah. was not there for whatever reason, because when Jesus killed the mother-in-law mm -hmm. she got up and cooked well one and two wouldn't wouldn't your daughter be at your bedside yeah. and like not even mentioned so yeah it it's speculation but it seems pretty solid of uh simon was married but his wife must have died um early on and so but here here he's taking care of his mother-in-law what a good guy take care of your mother-in-law <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. The community is important. They stay together and you went yep, yep. to another city and you had brothers or sisters or in-laws there. You, you didn't have hotels. Yeah, you, you stay with there. family. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and friends, you walked off All right, we're going we're gonna to stop because we're, we're two minutes over. But <laughs> that, that, one, that one thing, though, always then remember Jesus' family when Mary is pregnant they go to Bethlehem. Who are they supposed to stay with? Family, right? Why did they go back to Bethlehem? Because that's where Joseph's ancestors, he has family connections there. Where do they stay? Not with family. They're shunned. And I, I, I always, again, yeah, it's a little bit of speculation because the rumors were out 
Mary's pregnant. It's not Joseph's kid. And Mm -hmm. so she has like that scarlet letter kind of, and no family will welcome them. Mm. Anyway, that's that's what I always go to. Let's pray. I, I caused more minutes. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time. We have not not merely to speculate on your word, but to hear your word in, in truth and purity and given to us with, with authority, with the authority of Jesus, with the authority of the apostles and the Holy Spirit who uh, worked through those that, that wrote this down. And we pray that that same Holy Spirit would work in us, that we would lead our lives with that same kind of authority, led by your authority, but able to to believe with confidence, be able to speak uh, with confidence, and to hope with such confidence that we know that because you have spoken, it is true, and we can count on it always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.